class, um, I wanted to say a little bit about melting point depression and burning because a lot of people were asking me questions about it in, in my office yesterday. I usually, <coughs> excuse me, I usually have the class kind of act this out, um, and unfortunately we couldn't do that because the class is very, very large, and the, the lectures are a little bit shorter than they used to be. So um, I'm going to just do it here, and this way you can refer back to it. Um, this is a diagram called a melting point diagram. Um, this side of the diagram would, would represent, for example, the melting point of pure A or pure acid analyte. And this side of the diagram, for example, could represent the melting point of pure salicylic acid, which melts at about 156 degrees. And acid analyte melts between 114 and 116 degrees Celsius. Maybe a little higher. You might have gotten values that were slightly higher. In between are different combinations. And this diagram shows how compounds melt. Now basically, what the curve represents is the lower part of the curve is where melting begins. So for example, if I had this material right here, and it was, um, uh, for example, 90-10, uh, it was 90% acid analyte and 10% salicylic acid, the sample would start to melt around here. This is the beginning of melting, and that's where you would observe it. And by the way, the observation of melting is actually very difficult, as you have discovered. And it would finish melting up here, which would be somewhat below A. Some people said my curve bumped up a little bit. That's just like a, an error with the program I was using. Um, it should go down, continuously down. And as I've said to many of you, the only thing I really look at is the upper end of melting. I don't really pay much attention to what you guys report as the beginning of melting. Now... Um, so there's a couple points on here that are important. The first point is this point, which as you probably read in, your, read in your lab book, that's what's called the eutectic point. And the eutectic point corresponds to a eutectic composition. And what a eutectic, a eutectic um, point or eutectic sample um, or eutectic mixture, that's what they're really called. Again, it, ha it has a point in the diagram which is kind of interesting because it has a sharp melting point and it has a particular melting point associated with it which is called <coughs> the eutectic melting point and then it has a eutectic composition. Now what is this composition? This is really important to think about because you were making solutions at high temperature in class, right? You were dissolving a compound in a hot solvent and you were figuring out how much solvent to dissolve it. The eutectic, the eutectic composition or the eutectic mixture is that composition of the two compounds that are mutually soluble at an elevated temperature. Okay, so at, you have to think of these, even though these are solids at room temperature, that they could form a solution if the temperature was high enough and if you had the right composition. So I don't think of melting crude samples so much as um, melting as I think of making a solution at high temperature and that's how I want you to think about it and in this case because we were mainly working on this side of the diagram studying 8515, 955 and 100% acid analyte you should think of acid analyte as the solvent and you should think of salicylic acid as the solute in the um, solution that you're making so there's a certain combination of the two that mutually dissolve and they kind of dissolve perfectly in each other. Um, beyond that, if you have any more of one, of one or the other, you will exceed saturation of that solution and that material will be left out of the solution. So it's very much like if you hadn't added enough water to your acid analyte salicylic acid solutions in class where some of it wouldn't go in. And so if you're on either side of this, you have an excess. Am I okay? Okay, so what I'm going to do is just give you like some very simple theory to understand that. Okay, and this is how, I usually have students like hold molecules and like act this out. Someday I want to act it out in class with a smaller class. But last week I didn't have time, unfortunately. But anyway, um, I want you to know this. Okay, so the first thing I want to think about is, let's pretend we have a sample of A and B. And let's pretend that the eutectic, and I'm making this up, I'm telling you, I don't know exactly what the eutectic is for acid and salicylic acid. Well, let's pretend the eutectic mixture, that's that special mixture of A and B, is a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, it just takes one A to sweep one B into solution because they have good interactions with each other. 
at the elevated temperature. But remember, these are solids when they're pure, okay? Now, we have to think about several things. When things are melting, there is an interface between the solid and the liquid, okay? So for example, I'll call this the solid side and this the liquid side, but of course in a crystal, the interface is like extremely um, circuitous, you know, it's all kinds of tunnels through the crystal, the outside of the crystal, it's not a flat surface like I've drawn here, but imagine like this is the crystal and this is the liquid forming on the surface of the crystal and they have a very intimate relationship with each other and the melting is, is very much, very much reflects like what's going on at that interface and how fast the molecules can pass from one, in, one side to the other. So if you have puree, <coughs> puree, and that's all you've got, you know, pure, pure samples, as you know, melt sharp. So what, what happens? Like you start heating it up and as you're heating it up, um, the kinetic energy of the molecules increase and the molecules are moving around and they're getting hotter. And then you reach this temperature where you can overcome the intermolecular forces of the solid or the lattice energy, and the, the solid starts liquefying, okay? And so the solid starts moving into the liquid phase, and, and an equilibrium is established, and these molecules are moving back and forth when you get to the melting point. Remember, the melting point is an equilibrium between the solid and the liquid. What we do with the melting point machine is we always push past that, okay? So they're, they're moving back and forth, moving back and forth, moving back and forth. Now what I want to describe for you is that this is the maximum rate of movement of molecules between phases because it's all at. And I want you to think of the contaminant as an impediment. So if the contaminant is mixed in there, is mixed into the liquid, the contaminant makes it harder for the A and B to go back and forth, okay, so it moves at a slower rate. Slower rate of movement in an equilibrium requires a lower temperature. That's called melting point depression, okay? But when you have a pure solid, the rate of movement is at its maximum because there's no impediments caused by foreign molecules in the solution. Now, in your lab manual, I do talk about how the crystal lattice is weakened by those molecules, and that lowers the melting point. But the melting point is continuously depressed, and you have to explain that depression in terms of the rate of the movement. Okay, so again, no impediments. All right, so supposing I have another solid. So this is the sharp melting point. It just goes up, hits the melting point, it melts. It's a high rate of exchange because there's no impediments. So it has the highest possible melting point, which would be 114 to 116 for acid aniline. Now, supposing I've got contaminants in there, and I do this with numbers so people will understand. Now, of course, you can never really work with this ridiculously small number of molecules. But supposing I have A, B, and, you know, my, 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 my solid here is ridiculously organized. And then, then let's say there's more A's on the solid side. There's all these extra A's. So I've created this solid. And I want to melt this solid, okay? Now here's the deal. The first thing you would say, you should say, oh my goodness. That, and remember, this is the interface. It hasn't started liquefying yet. So again, you take this crude solid and it just, you know, it starts getting, your kinetic energy starts going up. But then you would say, oh, the lattice energy is lower because of the presence of these B molecules in the A because they have a different shape and they have different, different interactions. They're kind of going to disrupt the local molecules around it. And then those molecules are all kind of rocked and the whole crystal has like a lower energy. Now, so it's going to start melting at a lower temperature. Now, what, how does it melt? You have to realize all contaminated samples melt at the eutectic temperature. So whatever that eutectic temperature is, and I can tell you for your samples that you ran, it's probably like 79 or 80. Um, there's a temperature where you just start making this solution, this kind of special solution where they dissolve in each other. Don't think of it as melting. So it's like you've made it hot enough to start making a solution. And we have to find the solution here just for convenience sake as one to one ratio of A to B. All right, so it starts getting hot. You've gotten to the temperature where these two can dissolve in each other and make a solution, but the solution can only hold one of each molecule or a 50-50 ratio. So what's going to happen here when I hit 80 degrees or that eutectic point? And again, all contaminated samples start this way. So what will happen is, right, and I always have students kind of like dance their way across the room doing this, and it's, it's pretty effective usually, or at least I think it's effective, I don't know if the students think it's effective, but what would happen is whatever amount of A and B you had at that eutectic temperature would liquefy, right, and it would form this solution, 
But unfortunately, I'll, maybe I'll add an extra A here. Unfortunately, there's leftover A over here. There's A that can't, it doesn't have B to dissolve. Now, this is just at the eutectic temperature. So you're hovering at this low temperature, and this liquid forms, but it looks like slush. And the reason it looks like slush is there's this leftover A over here, right? So let's look at the ratio. So in the liquid, we have, we, at the eutectic, this is at the eutectic, temp. And this, again, is for all contaminated solutions. Like, people can't grasp that sometimes, all of them. Not just the eutectic mixture, all solutions initially form the eutectic mixture, which I think is fascinating. So the eutectic comp, at the, the eutectic uh, temp, right, what's going to happen with my little mini, my, my little molecule situation here, which is not realistic because you really melt millions of molecules, right? You can't work with this many molecules. How many do I have? One, two, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I have ten molecules, right? So I'm saying, what, this is the deal. In the liquid, we have the eutectic mixture because we're at the eutectic temperature. So what I have are three A's to three B's. That's what I've got. That's the eutectic mixture. Now you might say, well, do you really have that? Well, at the temperature, they're kind of going back and forth, but when you raise the temperature past that, that's what you've got, okay? Now, realize these Bs create an impediment to A moving back into the solid. That's called deposition. So the A does not depose back in the equilibrium as fast as it would if it were pure, okay? So that means the rate of exchange is lower. It's very low. The eutectic has the lowest rate of exchange. So these A's are moving back and forth, but they're moving back much slower because you can think of these B's as almost like getting in the way. Okay, and I have a little joke I usually make about that, but I'm not going to make the joke because I don't have time. So they're moving back. Okay, so, but the thing is because of the impediment or the, block, the blockage of that B, the rate of exchange is slower, so it can occur at a lower temperature. And that's probably a really good way to explain melting point depression, okay, that the Contaminant molecule slows down the rate of exchange of the major molecule such that you don't need as much heat to maintain that equilibrium because that's all you're trying to do is maintain equilibrium. But here's your problem, right? So you're hanging at the eutectic temperature at this low rate of exchange at this low temperature, but you still have A in the solid state and you're trying to melt the sample. So the A's have to move over here, right? So think about this. Supposing I just push one A over here. Think about that. What happens to my ratio here? My ratio goes from 4As to 3Bs. Now again, these really represent millions of molecules. So what this means is that I've increased the ratio in the liquid melt. So that means there's more As at the interface. And that means, means the rate of exchange has gone up significantly. And again, what, what if each of these represents 1 million molecules? Now I've got, um, you know, I've gone from a 50-50 ratio, you know, to a higher than 50-50 ratio, three to, a 4 to 3 ratio, that means there's more A there. That means it's, it needs to move faster. Its rate of exchange goes up. A, a higher rate of exchange requires a higher temperature. So think about this. If I throw the A over there and I'm hanging at the eutectic temperature, that A is going to depose right back into the solid because it can't, it can't maintain. It's like going back too fast, and the solid isn't pushing hard in the other direction to keep it moving. So what do you have to do? You have to raise the temperature. So when you raise the temperature, the solid gets hotter. When the solid gets hotter, you can get another A over here, right? Because now it's balanced. Because the solid's more <coughs> hotter, its kinetic energy's up, so it's pushing harder in this direction. But what's happened to the liquid? The liquid's temperature's gone up, but also the liquid's ratio has gone up. So now it can maintain a higher rate of exchange at the higher temperature. So now you're above the eutectic temperature. So then you say, well, i got to keep going. I'm only at four to three. I have 10 total molecules. So I've got to go to five A's to three B's. So when you put five over here, the percentage is even higher and it has to maintain an even higher rate of exchange. So that means the solid has to get even hotter. So the reason for broadening, if you were gonna say it in a nutshell, the reason for broadening is that once you get beyond the eutectic temperature, you have to constantly increase the percentage of the main, if you have an excess of one molecule, you have to constantly increase the ratio in the melt. And the increased ratio results in a much faster rate of exchange between the, at the interface. The, it requires, requires a faster rate of exchange. The requirement for the faster rate of exchange requires a higher temperature for the solid to kind of push back and maintain that rate of exchange. And the only way that can happen is for you to put the temperature up. 
So what happens is there's a different um, equilibrium temperature for every ratio. Now, what am I on time right now? 15. Okay, I'm going to stop it in like one second. What I want you guys to think about are a couple things. These are things to think about. Think about what happens if you have a perfect eutectic, like by some bizarre quirk of fate. This happens like once every 10 years, or no, maybe once every two years. I've seen this. Somebody just happens to have eutectic. It's very exciting when it happens. So say you've got exactly the eutectic. And again, I made up this eutectic, okay? I just said, it's supposed to have exactly the eutectic. Think about what's going to happen. I want you to be able to explain to me why <coughs> a eutectic is depressed, a perfect eutectic mixture, not something that starts as eutectic and then has to add another molecule in, but a perfect eutectic starts low, depressed, but it's sharp. Why is it sharp? Think about it. When it starts melting, it is a eutectic. Um, the other thing I want you to think about is if you have something that's very mildly contaminated, like if you have something like that, and you have like one B in there, all right? I want you to think about the fact that all samples start melting at the eutectic temperature, even the crude ones. And you'll say, that's not true. That's not true because my melting point ranges are much narrower when my sample is pure. However, it really does start, start at the eutectic. But I want you to think about the quantities involved when you have very little contaminant. Like, if I've got a 99% sample, say I've got one B molecule in there, right? I'm going to make eutectic, but how much eutectic am I going to make? Am I going to be able to see it? Like, that's something to think about. So anyway, I think this kind of explains it in a different way than the, the classic way it's explained in the lab book. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm explaining it instead of in terms of vapor pressures, but against, like, what's going on at the interface and what I call escaping tendencies. And, of course, the presence of a contaminant reduces the escaping tendency. But integral to understanding this is understanding there is a solution called the eutectic solution, and it's formed for all the contaminated samples, not just for a perfect eutectic. Okay, I'll see you in class.